made it. Amen. Scripture says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Father, I pray that you'd give me the gift of teaching this morning. You said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who upbraideth not, giveth to all men liberally. I need wisdom, Father, not just a head full of facts. I need wisdom. And I pray that you'd open the hearts of the people to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now this will be the second lesson in this series that we started last week on the, uh, the book of Job. And uh, if you'd like to turn there with me this morning, Job chapter 9, verse 9. It's very important to remember this, the chronology of the New Testament and Old Testament. Chronological dates. The first book of the Bible, the Pentateuch, was written by Moses about 1400 B.C. We know that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Called the Pentateuch because you got five books. But the book of Job, many believe, and I believe also, is the oldest book in the Old Testament, which dates back to about 1900 B.C. Makes Job a contemporary of Abraham. Before a tabernacle, before a temple, before a priesthood, before any of these things existed, it's kind of like uh, Jethro, when Jethro was the priest of Midian. It's like Melchizedek, who was the uh, king of righteousness. Melchizedek is what his name means, Hebrews chapter 7. It's like these individuals pointed out in the Old Testament that certainly were respected. Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. We're going about 1900 B.C., you see, this is long before Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, or any of that. We're going back in time. So in Job, we have no written Bible. We have no scriptures. We have no tabernacle, no priest. The, one of the, the jobs of the priest was to teach, and we have no teaching priesthood. We have none of that. So what do we have? Where does this knowledge come from? What, what did they have before the written scripture? All that years, all those years, the flood came about, uh, well, some say about 2100 B.C., 2140, somewhere along in there. Uh, we're talking about 2,000 years almost there from the creation of Adam until the flood came. What scripture did they have? There's no written record. See, there's no written scripture. The first scripture that showed up, Moses wrote it, 1400 B.C., but what we do have in the book of Job is an ancient record of knowledge disseminated to people. Job chapter 9, verse 9. Look carefully at it. Job 9, 9. Which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Well, what in the world is this? Well, these are names of the constellations in the heavens. You'll find it all through the book of Job. But jump quickly to the psalm. Psalm 19. And you'll have, uh, you'll have a, a commentary on these uh, constellations given in Scripture. Verse 1, Psalm, uh, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day into day uttereth speech, night into night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now that's remarkable, don't you think? When I told you last week that the Chinese and the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the ancient Egyptians, when it comes to the signs of the zodiac, are all in agreement. Twelve of them in a circle. Why would they have the same names? We're talking about cultures that are far removed from each other, yet they have the same names. It tells you there's a common source. Exactly. So the common source, obviously, must come from God. So we have here in Psalm 19... Verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Now hold your place there and turn to Romans chapter number 10. And lo and behold, we have a quotation in the book of Romans from uh, Psalm 19. Romans chapter 10. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with the issue of belief and salvation. See? Belief and salvation. So he's connecting belief and salvation with an understanding of what's going on above your head. Psalm 19 is talking about it, giving a commentary on what Job talks about. In Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 18. 
But I say, have they not heard? Watch this. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Hold your place there and see if that's close to what it says in Psalm 19, verse 4. Their line is gone throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That's an exact quotation. Their words to the end of the world. So the Apostle Paul is quoting Psalm 19, and he's applying it. Now, it's a good study to see how the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament and how they apply it, because sometimes the Old Testament is quoted in more than one context. The application is made according to different things. Here, the Apostle Paul is quoting Psalm 19 and making the application as it relates to salvation. Therefore, an understanding of the heavens has a message that relates to salvation. And that's what he's talking about here in the book of uh, Romans chapter number 10. So this is the basis, the foundation for which we're going to launch out into the rest of this study. And that is that the Old Testament, before it was written in Scripture, for example, go back to Psalm 19 with me. And let me show you how it progresses. Psalm 19, there's a progression here. All, you, normally, about anywhere in the Bible, with about anything, there's always a progression. God has revealed Himself progressively. How do I know that? You can hold your place there, and I'll quote Hebrews chapter number 1 for you this morning. Because this is, this is a remarkable statement and very important. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. He has revealed Himself in the greatest revelation that God could reveal Himself until He, until he is seen by His Son. If you know the Son, you know God. Psalm 19, in verse number 5 and verse 6, has to do with what you can read in the heavens, the message that's involved there. But then look at verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the, simp the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, so forth and so on. Now hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Is this true? Of course it's true. I believe the Bible. But I am forced to put it in context. Was there a law of the Lord in, Psalm, in, in, uh, in Job 9? What law was written then? There was no law written then. Moses is called the lawgiver, right? When he went to the top of Sinai, he received the Ten Commandments by the finger of God in stone. That's when the law was given that he's talking about here. Now the fact... Whether or not, you know, it doesn't have to be written down to exist. Laws exist in the nature of man. It says in the book of Romans that the law is written in their heart, their conscience excusing or accusing them, one or the other. Sure, sure, there's a natural law written in the heart of man. But that's not what he's talking about here in Psalm 19. He's talking about the written law. The law. And the law, of course, was given to Moses which is long after. But he see, the writer of Psalm 19 is, is, is writing after the fact and making a comparison for the two. That's what's going on here. The writer of Psalm 19 to the chief musician, a psalm of David. That's what the heading says on my Bible. When did David live? It's good to get a chronology of the Bible. 1,000 B.C. 1,000 B.C. All right, that's when David lived. 900 years after the book of Job. What it's talking about. See the span of time? Did you realize that from the time of Christ to the time of Job was almost as long as it has been from the time of Christ to us today? It's been 2,000 years from today back to Christ. And it was almost 2,000 years from Christ back to Job. This gives you an idea of the expanse of time that the Bible covers. Yes, that's, that's a quite a remarkable thing. Now, we know there are on this earth what we call anomalies. An anomaly is, anomos in, in Hebrew means law. Okay, deuteronomy, namos, deuteronomos means the second giving of the law. All right, anomos is law. Anomaly, anomaly means no law. Without the law, see. In other words, it doesn't fit the pattern. It doesn't. It doesn't fit. It doesn't. It. It, it just doesn't. It shouldn't belong there. Like if you're going down to, uh, you, you, let's say you're digging at the top of, of a Megiddo. It has 23 layers of civilization. 23. 
I've stood at the top of Megiddo and looked down upon the Valley of Esdraelon, where they say the final battle is going to take place with the, with the Antichrist. All right? Underneath your feet are 23 distinct separate layers of civilization. Now think about that for a minute. 23. 23 different they, they tear down, they build on top. They tear down, they build on top. They're burned up through war, they build on top. They build on top. And it gradually grows until it becomes what's called a tell. You've heard of Tell Dan, haven't you? Well, Tell Megiddo. That's a man-made mountain. Well, imagine standing on the top of Megiddo and digging down to the 23rd layer at the bottom and finding a computer. Wouldn't work. <laughs> it doesn't fit. It doesn't belong there, see. Computer doesn't belong there. That's an anomaly. That's something that's, it's, you can't deny its existence, but it doesn't fit. So you've got to figure out what's going on here. Did somebody come along before me and dig a hole and put it down there? Or did they have computers 2,000 years before Christ? See what I'm saying here? There's an anomaly sitting down there in Egypt, and it's called the Great Pyramid. It doesn't fit. You know why it doesn't fit? Because the knowledge contained in the Great Pyramid is vastly superior to anything else that anyone knew on the face of the earth. Vastly superior. Now, I'm going to deal with some of these this morning. I'm not going to deal with the number of blocks and the weights and all of that. That's the fantastic study in itself. But I want to go to something that I think is very important about the message that's coming out of this great pyramid. It's called the Pyramid of Giza. I've been in it. I went one time with Brother Bevington. We went to Egypt. We went to Cairo. I went down inside that thing. I went all the way to the king's chamber. And there is a hewn out uh, sarcophagus where the body of the king supposedly had lain. And to me, it was, it was quite an astounding experience. And I knew it was probably a once in a lifetime experience that I would never do again. But I went down through this shaft into the heart of that pyramid and saw it firsthand. And let me tell you something of all the things I've done on this earth, I'm glad I did that. I am glad I did it. I'm glad I was there. The Great Pyramid is the only pyramid in the world to have slight concave faces on all four sides. What do you mean? Well, a pyramid like this, see? Like this? Well, my hand is flat, okay? I've got a pyramid. My hand's flat. But the Pyramid of Giza is not flat. It goes in just a little bit, okay? Just slight. You can see it if you're above it. That's strange, isn't it? You can't tell it when you're on the ground, but you can see it when you're above it. Another baffling fact, the Great Pyramid has four sides. It actually has eight sides. One each of the four sides, there is an indentation of laser precision that divides each face into two pieces. Now we've got eight faces, see, like this, that make up the four sides of the pyramid. From ground, viewers will not see the indentations. They can only see four faces. In order to see them, all, four, all eight faces of the pyramid, one needs to go aerial, and that too when the lighting conditions are perfect to make the eight faces. So you can't just go up in the noonday sun and see them. It has to be the exact time of the year. Now we're getting a little deeper here, aren't we? We're getting into the calendar. The eight faces of the pyramid are visible only during the autumn equinox, day and night, same length, and the spring equinox, day and night, same length, during dawn as well as during sunset. These are the times when the sun casts a shadow on the pyramid, making the indentations properly visible from air. Now, how'd they get up in the air to create something like this that could only be appreciated from the air? You follow me now? Why build something that could only be seen from the air two times a year? How'd they get up there? You know, we know the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the first ones to fly. Like Columbus was the first one to discover America. Right? Of course, he, didn't, he never set foot on this continent, but he came across. And <clears throat> but anyway, inside the pyramid, the temperature is maintained at 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The temperature never changes and actually the Earth's average temperature. How they know that? The Great Pyramid, now let me go on down to the next one. The Great Pyramid of Giza, I've got a bunch of them here, but for the sake of time, I'm on, I've only picked out certain ones that I want to cover because I'm leading up to something. The Great Pyramid of Giza has some incredible mathematical, geological, and astronomical science. For example, if the total mass of the pyramid is, is multiplied by 10 raised to the 8th power, what we really get is the mass slightly greater than the mass of the earth. How'd they know that? All measurements of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, which is the pharaoh that's supposed to have built it, are in pyramid inches. Even the granite coffer present in the king's chamber uses the same unit of measurement. The base of the coffer has a perimeter of 135 point many decimals pyramid, pyramid inches, doubling this value and multiplying it by 10 to the 8th power again gives us the radius of the sun. How in the world could they have known the radius of the sun? The Great Pyramid sits right on top of the center of Earth's land mass. Now listen carefully to this. Or Earth's geographical center. The east-west axis of the pyramid corresponds to Earth's longest land parallel. This parallel passes right through Asia, Africa, and America. On the other hand, on the other hand, rather, Earth's longest land meridian that is known to pass through Antarctica, Europe, Africa and Asia also runs directly through the pyramid. So the Great Pyramid of Giza is actually the place where the parallel and meridian intersects each other. Now how in the world could that happen? In Egypt, and these two, uh, these two uh, intersect at the pyramid. We have latitude and longitude. That's one of the first things I had to learn when I tried to fly an airplane. I learned how to fly before we had GPS. <laughs> we flew by the seat of our pants, they called it back then. <laughs> Sometimes you get up there and you know what that is. <laughs> one of the worst things you can do flying an airplane is to lose your way <laughs> and get lost. Because if you run out of gas, there are no gas stations up there. <laughs> You're coming down. <laughs> You're coming down. And one guy, he took a, he took a, he took his final flight. He'd gone through the whole course, all of his hours. He took his final flight. He went with his flight instructor. She took him up about 5,000 feet. He got up there and he got lost. And he wound up in Knoxville. And needless to say, he failed his flight exam. It sits on top of the Earth's geographical center. What are the odds of the pyramid being actually accidentally built at Earth's geographical center. The odds given here is one out of three billion. That's B billion. One out of three billion. The only way the Earth's surface can endure, now listen to this, the only way the Earth's surface can endure the massive weight of the Great Pyramid is if there is a solid mountain made solely of rock that lies right beneath the pyramid. Well, that's actually what it is. A solid, flat mountain of granite lies right beneath the surface of the earth where the Great Pyramid stands. Now, hold on a minute. The Great Pyramid is at the geographical center of the earth where the lines intersect. And lo and behold, where they're going to build that pyramid, there's a mountain underneath there of granite. It almost makes you think somebody put that mountain under there, knowing they'd build a pyramid there, being instructed to build a pyramid on top of that mountain, and the mountain was put there when God said, let there be. You think the Lord's smart enough to look into the future and know how to do something like that? 
You know what? You know you know one of the things that that really boggles the mind of a human being and and and, and really affects our faith. That is that we don't really think God's that smart. We can't fathom someone with that kind of in, that kind of intelligence, because that makes him so much greater than us. Like a book that prophesies of all hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that came to pass in the life of Christ, and yet and yet to be fulfilled in the future. There's only one that knows the end and the beginning. So, the only way that this could happen. Now listen to this. The average land height above sea level is 5,449 inches. We're talking about average. This measurement has been given by modern-day computers and satellites. They've arrived at that. I don't know when, how recent. Interestingly, the exact height of the pyramid happens to be 5,449 inches. As we mentioned earlier, each of the four sides of the pyramid are concave. Now watch this. This indentation is visible only from the air. We, however, did mention that the curvature of the concave faces of the pyramid. Now let's get to what we're talking about. Here we are. We've got a pyramid. That's a flat surface. But it's a little concave. It goes in just a little bit. All right? Now it's just not hit or miss. It's, it's, it's laser precision. And there is a specific angle that it goes in. Okay? On that concave. When you take that angle, figure it, and compare it to the earth Here's what you get. It is exactly the same as the Earth's curvature. Now bolt on for a minute and just think about what I just said. The Earth's curvature is at an angle. Okay? It's a certain, it's not just up here a little bit and then down here. It's circle. And the pyramid... The concave part is exactly the same as the curvature of the earth. How did they know that? How in the world did they know that? Now, if that's not surprising enough, here's something more. If on each side of the pyramid we measure the base from corner to corner as a straight line, we get 9,131 pyramid inches for all four sides. This will measure... 36,524 pyramid inches, which is actually the circumference of the pyramid. If we move the decimal point to two left places to the left, what we get is 365.24 pyramid inches, which is the exact length of a solar year as of modern calculations. So not only did they know the exact curvature of the earth, they knew exactly what a solar, the length of a solar year was, and they knew the circumference of the sun. We know that pi is the universal relationship between the diameter and circumference of a circle. If the pyramid circumference is divided by twice the apex height of the pyramid, we get the value of 3.14159. This is pi. Just in case you're wondering, the actual height of the Great Pyramid of Giza, including the apex that is now missing, was 5,812.98 pyramid inches. It is not that pi is present only in height and circumference relationship of the pyramid. The same has been used in numerous places in the whole pyramid. Not just the pi, the golden ratio, or phi, which equals 1.618, is also present in the fundamental proportions of the Great Pyramid. In other words, a mathematical and geometrical genius put it together. Interestingly enough, the fractal value of light's speed in a vacuum is also encoded in the pyramid's structure. They knew the speed of light. Now this is way, 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 way past what anyone should have known. Now listen to this one. 
The Great Pyramid is aligned to Earth's true north, not magnetic, but true. And this alignment is extremely accurate with an error of only three sixtieth of one degree. Now, I was mentioned last week, and I'm going to get back into it this morning, the precession of the equinoxes. This is, this is where we're going. It is known fact that the North Pole's position shifts over time, and hence it can be concluded that when the pyramid was constructed, there was no error whatsoever. In plainer words, when the pyramid was built, it was pointing directly at Alpha Draconis, the dragon. It was pointing directly at the dragon. What's important about that? Look at it in just a minute. Why the dragon? Why the North Pole? Why is it called the dragon? Pointing directly at it. That's remarkable, don't you think? Nothing, it appears that nothing in the pyramid, absolutely nothing, is just there for space. There's a reason for every bit of it. Given the angle of the pyramid's sides versus its latitude, the Great Pyramid casts no shadow at all during the noon of the spring equinox. That's when you can be up above it. Remember, you can see all eight sides and there is no shadow on the earth during the spring equinox. Now, the Bible tells us when to start counting the months and the year. The word January comes from the pagan Janus. Janus has two faces. He has a face looking to the past. He has a face looking to the future. This is where we get the month January. On our calendar is the first month of the year. Don't you think it's remarkable that we start our year in the dead of winter? God told them in the, in the, in, in the Bible to start their year in spring. In spring, all right? In the springtime. That's when you start it, not in the dead of winter. So you start counting your days from the spring. It's the beginning of months, he said to them. Israel has two calendars. They have a sacred calendar and they have a profane or a secular calendar. The beginning of the year in, in the secular calendar, I think somewhere along in September, and the beginning, of, of course, is the, the, the religious calendar is in the springtime, staying with the Old Testament scripture. So, the, ca the shadow is not cast. No shadows on that day. No shadows. A shadow is a, is, is a, uh, is, is a, is a covering of the light. Go, I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. It's not death itself, but it is the appearance of death. You see, the shadow of death. According to alternative Egyptology, the three pyramids in the Giza pyramid complex are aligned or positioned relative to the position of the three stars that form the belt of Orion, a constellation that is mentioned in the book of Job. Orion is mentioned specifically in Job. Robert Bovell, who first put forth the Orion correlation theory, states that just like the three stars of the Orion belt, the three pyramids, including Great Pyramid of Giza, have a southwesterly slant. According to him, if the orientation of the three pyramids in relation to the Nile River actually recreates the orientation of the three stars of the Orion belt to our Milky Way galaxy. The bottom line is this. That if you look up at Orion, the constellation that Job is talking about, you can see these stars that are fixed in the heavens. You can take that fixation, that fixed position, and transpose it down to the earth. Just take the way they're fixed, move it down to the earth, and you'll find that the pyramids in relation to the Nile River are exactly the way that Orion is in the heavens. That tells me that there's something important about Orion that there's a connection going on between Orion and the pyramid. Now listen to this. The so-called descending passage that goes down from the original entrance of the pyramid is placed vertically above the ground is pointed towards Alpha Draconis, I mentioned a moment ago, which used to be the pole star or the north star circa around 2170 to 2144 B.C.E. Now, B.C.E. 
if you see this when you're reading, means before the common era. They used that to do away with Anno Domini A.D. and B.C. before Christ. Christians don't use B.C.E. Christians use B.C. Why? Because my calendar relates to him before Christ. Okay, but anyway, so you'll know what it is. B.C.E. means before the common era. Notice the dates. 2170 B.C. to 2144 B.C., this shaft was pointing directly at what? The dragon, Alpha Draconis. I thought to myself, did something happen about that period of time that might make that important? And I found something, but I'll get to that in a moment. The king's chamber, southern shaft, pointed directly at Zeta Orionis. Orionis, Zeta Orionis, or Al Natak, a star in the Orion belt in around 2450 BCE, which is the date supposedly that this, that this pyramid was built. Though it is said that the Great Pyramid of Giza was supposed to be the tomb of Khufu, there are absolutely no indications that the Pharaoh's body, along with his riches, were put inside the pyramid. The granite coffer or sarcophagus inside the king's chamber has no signs to tell that it was actually occupied in some point in time. It's important. Top of that, there are no hieroglyphics found inside the Great Pyramid except for some in red paint and its graffiti, which as of date are known to be not authentic. I've seen some of them. I went inside, I told you I've been in the pyramid, and you can look on the wall and you can see graffiti that's over 2,000 years old. Now, that didn't blow your mind. You're looking at graffiti that's over 2,000 years old, but it's not original. It's what was put up there later. No hieroglyphics were found inside the Great Pyramid except for some in red. There are absolutely, now listen to this, no records found about the Great Pyramid. No artifacts, no inventory, no drawing or picture, just nothing. In doing my research on this, I discovered that they have found a papyrus about three or four years ago. This papyrus, papyrus was written 2000 B.C., somewhere along in there. They, they, they dated at that time. They are, they are saying, they're telling people that this papyrus was written by someone who had part in or observed the building of the, of the pyramid of Giza. You dig a little deeper into it and you find out that no direct reference is made to the pyramid of Giza. It's only talking about the building of a pyramid at Giza. There's a difference. See? So why is that important? It's important because they don't want to allow for something to be so far advanced to their to, to, to Darwin, they want they want to make the building of the pyramid a uh, an advancement in human technology, you know, for the time, but they want to downplay it like everything else and make it fit their mold and their agenda. As I told you before, it's an anomaly, folks. It doesn't fit. It does not fit. So the statement still stands true. There is no record in Egypt anywhere of a great pyramid. And there are no hieroglyphics inside that pyramid. Think about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, this pyramid shaft is pointing to Alpha Draconis, 2170-2144 B.C. So I went back into a little bit of history and did some digging. Guess who shows up during that period of time? Antiochus Epiphanes. Who is that? That is a Syrian ruler who came into Israel, went to the temple of God, slew a, 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 a swine, took its blood, put it on the altar, raised up an image and a statue to Zeus, who's supposed to be the, 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 the prince of all, or the king of all the gods, 
and turned on the Jews and began to persecute them and crucify them, kill them, what have you. He goes down in history as a classic type of the Antichrist. Isn't that amazing? That this shaft is pointing directly at the dragon? Revelation 12, who's the dragon? The devil. Revelation 13, who's the dragon incarnate in flesh? Antichrist. Say, so, well, that's just a coincidence. Well, you pass it off as a coincidence for you. I don't think so. I think there's a reason for that. I believe, from what I'm reading here, that the pyramid is sitting there as a message about a timeline, about what happened in the past and what's coming in the future. This is a remarkable thing, and this is only a small portion, folks. I mean, there's a, for the sake of time, we can't get into all of it. But what I'm trying to do is show you how important this is. Now, here's the question. We have to ask ourselves this question. Who did this? Where did this come from? Where did this knowledge come from? I mean, we're talking about the circumference of the sun, speed of light. We're talking about the mass of the earth. We're talking about the geographical center of the earth. We're talking about stuff that people back then, did they know this? The speed of light? Are you kidding? Where did it come from? Now, there's a lot of theories. One theory is that it was built by knowledge that the angels that came down to the earth in Genesis 6 imparted to men, and that knowledge that the angels imparted to men was, uh, was essentially as a monument as a monument to the rebellion against God because they were elevating men in knowledge above the knowledge of God. There's a force against a force here. This is what theosophy, this is what the occult world, this is what all of this stuff I've been going on now for weeks about is about. It's about them ta saying to you, listen, don't mess around with the church over there. This is a bunch of old, old fools. They believe that old Bible, that old archaic stuff. Listen, we've got this enlightenment. We can teach you. We can show you. We can elevate you above all of that foolishness. We have so much more that we can show you. Oh, yeah, there are relative truths to be found in the Bible. We can read it, and there's a little bit of inspiration here and there. But if you want to know the real truth, that's what Blavatsky in her, in her shield about theosophy says. What is it? There's no truth but absolute truth or in the search of the truth. Something about the truth. Something about the truth. In other words, if you don't belong to our crowd and follow what we teach you and, and, you know, and, and believe what we're going to tell you, you don't know anything about the truth. As I was coming through the door, a lady handed me a, a little thing here. I've got it here in my Bible somewhere. Here it is. Past lives, dreams, soul travel. The bottom, Ekinkar. Anyone's ever heard of them? Ekinkar is nothing in the world more than an offshoot and a different spin on the same old lie that Theosophy was preaching a hundred and something years ago. It's about an enlightenment. It's about come to us and we're going to raise your, raise your spiritual temperature. We're going to lift you up and let you see. We have knowledge that the rest of them don't have. That's what alchemy was about. That's what the Philosopher's Stone was about. It's about learning something that no one else has. It's about the elixir of life. You ever heard of that one? The elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, alchemy, to change base metals into gold. But it's more, than a, it's more than a stone or a metal. It has to do with a philosophy. That's why it's called the philosopher's stone. It has to do with being able to find the hidden element that will give you eternal life. Eternal life without the new birth. See what I mean? Eternal life. Who was it looking for the fountain of youth down there? I've been in St. Augustine. They, who was, was it Augustine? Who? Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Lion. That's what Leon means. Ponce de Leon. He was looking for the fountain of youth. Let me tell you where the fountain of youth is. It comes from the water of life. Spring of living water. That's the fountain of youth. You drink of that water, he said, you'll live forever. I'm the bread that God sent down from heaven. Eat this bread and you'll live, not as Moses ate it in the wilderness, and they died. I am the bread of life, he said. All these metaphors that he uses in the Gospel of John can be related directly back to the Old Testament about this thing, that thing, this thing, that thing, but it all comes down to Christ is the answer for all of it. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer to everything that was in the Old Testament that gave you anything. Now it's a person. Amen. Amen. So what do you got here? Well, to me, that's one of the most plausible theories of all, is that these angels come down before the flood, and they offer all of this advanced knowledge to mankind, which blows them away. I mean, how would you feel if, if something showed up and it just you knew you were light years ahead of everybody else? This is why God said to Daniel in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter number 12, He said, knowledge shall increase. And buddy, he was serious about that. He was serious about that. Just in the last 50 years, our knowledge has, let, has, has grown exponentially. It's like Obama when he went in office as a president. The national debt was what? Ten, ten, ten thousand billion dollars? Ten trillion? And when he left office, it was what? Twenty trillion. Twenty, twenty trillion. In other words, in, in, in eight years in office, Obama increased the national debt more in eight years than all of the preceding presidents before him. I didn't mean to get political. I'm sorry. We'll leave out here. <laughs> That's just... That's what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about how things just all of a sudden boom. See? Everything just boom, right? The worst wildfires they've ever had in California, the worst flooding they've ever had in Houston, Texas, the worst hurricane to ever hit Puerto Rico, the worst this, the greatest that, the worst this, all of these superlatives, all of a sudden, why are we getting all of this? Why are we getting all this all of a sudden? Makes you wonder, doesn't it, brother? Martin, I know too. I know he's coming back. Now you know you got a crowd out there saying it today is uh, is Armageddon, the fifteenth of October. This is the apocalypse. They've been setting dates. Twenty third of September didn't work out, so they pushed it up to October the fifteenth. It's a good thing they've got a calendar that they can manipulate. You know, they can just keep pushing it off into the future. And they're not new with it. They're not the first ones. William Miller had a bunch meet on top of a mountain. And the Millerites, they called them, and they met on top of a mountain for the second coming of the Lord, sold all their possessions. He didn't come, but then they came out later on and said, well, he entered his holy temple in the heavens. And they, they, and they, and they, they changed it a little bit, and they on and on and on and on and on it goes. Nobody knows the date of the coming of the Lord, folks, not even the Son. The Father hath retained that to his knowledge. Amen. All right, we'll pick it up again next week. It's Fifteen till already. And uh, see where this thing leads us. See where it leads us. Father, I pray you bless the study of your word now. In Jesus' name.